Good evening, I'm David Nicholas. Next here on CMU Public Television, Representative Stacey Irwin Oaks joins me right here on Capitol Report. Welcome to Capitol Report, a weekly discussion with your elected officials on the issues and concerns that affect you. And thanks again, as always, for being with us. Uh, we are joined this week by Representative Stacey Irwin Oaks, Democrat from Saginaw, currently serving in her second full term as a representative for the state's 95th district. Representative, good to see you. Welcome good, back. Good to see you as well. Thank you for having me back. Well, I'd like to begin with the first of what may prove to be several multi-layered things. That's just the news where we find ourselves these days. Uh, the state news that put us on the national um, discussion this past week. U.S. District Court in Detroit ruling that Michigan's voter-approved ban on same-sex marriage was unconstitutional. Four county clerks opened, the, uh, opened to issue licenses last week. 300 weddings performed. Sixth Circuit Court in Cincinnati issues the stay. And currently we find ourselves then in a pause while the state uh, continues that appeal. Now, Governor Snyder has said that the state has recognized civil unions but cannot recognize the wedded status of these 300 couples while the appeal goes on. Further, a letter to Attorney General Eric Holder um, has brought word now from the federal government that the married status will be recognized. Mm -hmm. Politics and, and, and partisan debate is, is currently, of course, very much involved in all of this, but because you come to us as, as an attorney, I wonder if we can set the politics aside and look at uh, the structure of who can say what, who can rule and, and issue such opinions. Does the Attorney General, do we know, have the specific authority to do this from the federal level to recognize that status? Um, the Attorney General does have the authority to request a stay, which is what he requested, and the stay was, stay was given. But ultimately, you know, it would be my hope that the governor would use his executive authority and request that the Attorney General withdraw his stay. Um, the federal government had spoken, the courts have spoken, but if the question is indeed if the Attorney General has the authority to request a stay, the Attorney General does. And what about that confusion that I think is there between the position right now that the state is taking and then the appeal to the U.S. Attorney General who says that the federal government will recognize that status and yet the state right now is putting a hold? Where, where do we see that perhaps blurring of those two authorities? Well, ultimately, it's it's very uh, disappointing because, as we know, these 300 couples and, and more have waited many years to uh, wed. So that puts them in a position where they now have to wait for uh, the decision to be made by the courts, by the Sixth Circuit, um, because the Attorney General has requested this stay and he's appealing uh, the decision of the lower court. So that does put them in a very precarious position, especially with the federal government and the people of this state overwhelmingly um, saying that they believe that these not only civil unions but these marriages should stand. Um, this week the House of Representatives was presented with a resolution where many of the legislators, including myself, co-sponsored, uh, ultimately saying that we need to at least recognize the 300 legal weddings that occurred this past Saturday. Is this likely, you think, headed to eventually the U.S. Supreme Court? Yes. <laughs> Succinctly there. Congressman Dan Kildee of Flint, whose uh, fifth district includes your state house district, was one of the signers of the letter uh, that went to Attorney General Holder. Um, as uh, this is likely to, to play out into potentially campaigns for this fall and just ongoing contact that you have with those that you represent, what are your constituents telling you as, as far as a position they feel that the state and or federal law should be taking on this? Um, my constituents are basically telling me that we need to be focusing on roads, we need to be focusing on education, we need to be focusing on making sure education is properly funded. Um, the reality is that they respect the will of couples to, to marry and they, they support them wholeheartedly. Um, it is not their belief that uh, the Attorney General should be uh, impeding in this process, even if he does have the authority. Um, they are very frustrated, not only with the state legislature, but also the federal legislature as to um, 
uh, how much time we are, are spending on issues where people have resolved that people should love who they want to love, they should marry who they want to marry, and if they uh, choose not to marry, they should have that option as well. But more importantly, or just as important, they really want they, they want jobs, they want economic development. Those are the, the costs that I receive, and they, they really are frustrated with um, the fact that we're going through the legal proceedings, whether they are within um, it, his ability to take to request the stay or not. How are the roads in and around Saginaw? <laughs> um, the roads in and around Saginaw are much like they are throughout most of the state. It's it's very embarrassing. Um, it's you have potholes everywhere. Uh, they are dilapidated not not only in the inner city but the out county and the highways alike. Um, as a former uh, assistant attorney general for. MDOT, I can tell you that you know our, many of our bridges get very low ratings. We need to fund our infrastructure. With money that then was approved by the legislature and, and the, the competing versions from the House and Senate, um, as we sit down today, how much more defined is it as to the amount of money that would be coming to your district to address the emergency funding and then also projecting ahead to uh, the road construction projects for the upcoming season? Well, in, in Saginaw County alone, we, they have spent almost a uh, million dollars over uh, with, with the additional salt that was needed to take care of the roads during this winter of 2014. So, you know, no one's going to discount the fact that, you know, we're, they're grateful to receive additional funding, but, you know, does it, is it additional funding or does it just put them back even to where they would have been if they would not have had to spend the additional funding uh, for this winter that we had? At the end of the day, all of those things need to be taken in consideration and um, from a state level, uh, we need to make sure we properly fund it. I've been asking everyone that has come in in the last uh, several weeks on the program uh, the same question as, as it refers back to the governor's original proposal asking for the $1.2 billion per year over 10 years and then of course the question of how we pay for that. The proposals that are out there now um, either to those that you've been able to review or uh, that your your constituents are telling you what seems to have the most support as to us eventually coming up with more and more sustainable uh, funding for the roads. Well, I don't think you will find a person in the state of Michigan who doesn't believe we need to fund our roads and we need to make sure that whether that one Point two billion dollars is is put into our roads. Uh, again, the question would be: Is how do we get to that point? And what I hear is, um, I think we have uh, had our shared sacrifice. We have sacrificed our pensions and with them being taxed. We have sacrificed our education system. They don't want to see another tax where they don't feel like everyone is paying into. Um, the ability to to fund our infrastructure. I think right now we must have a system where everyone feels like it's an even playing field and it's not a burdensome ta tax on the middle class or or those most impoverished. What about the proposal then uh, from Senator Howard Walker that would take out uh, the sales taxes that have been applied at the pump, uh, but then would put in place a, uh, I believe it's a one percent increase on the overall state sales tax. Does that meet? The, the eye test or the litmus test to, to spreading that out over everyone, including perhaps a lot more money coming in from those visiting the state, and, and what traction do you think that plan might have? I think, I think it's a starting point, whether it's enough to actually fund it. Um, I haven't seen anything that shows that it is indeed um, the proper way to fund it, but what we do know is uh, we're the state that put the nation on wheels and General Motors and everyone else is doing a lot better job at uh, creating fuel efficient vehicles. So some of that extra tax at the pump it, and revenue is, is really just not there. So you know whether that's a, a starting point, Maybe it is, but it has to be something that's uh, sustainable. And the question has also come up in the fact that, that it, at least from my perspective, and I think a lot of people did not know that sales tax uh, applied to anything that is a certain, uh, by the Constitution, takes a certain amount and puts it towards a school aid fund so that all of the money that is being taxed at the pump is not all going then directly to the roads. So the question of pulling and adjusting those taxes then creating a potential hole in the school aid fund, um, what, where do you come in on, on some of the proposals on how we try to balance out those numbers so that schools can be paid for, roads can be paid for, and, and where the, that money would go? 
Well, I think part of the starting point is making sure that the funds that do make it into the school aid fund actually makes it into the school system. As you know, that there was uh, a a a request for a constitutional amendment to make sure that school aid funding was restricted to K-12 funding. Unfortunately, what we've seen over the past few years is that the school aid fund has been robbed of $1 billion. Therefore, although the money may make it into the school aid fund, however much it is, making sure it makes it into the classrooms is, is what's most important. There were people that, and when this came up, it, the, it went down to defeat once again um, as an overall concept. but. But we find ourselves, uh, from where we sit on the university campus, from obviously the, the K-12 interests that you have and represent too, that those are one of the few areas where, by our Constitution in 1963, we can have any flexibility with all the earmarks that are in place. And so the question that continually comes up, do we need to consider reopening? Uh, if we don't reopen that entire Constitution, how do we give ourselves enough flexibility within that budget and yet secure something that we say is a, such a high priority as our K-12 schools? K-12 school is, is a high priority. Uh, birth through five funding is a high priority. And I think in order for us to show that it is a high priority, we need to do a constitutional amendment that specifically addresses that funding. When Senator Emmons was here last week, uh, we spoke to uh, the overall practice of citizen government uh, in reference to, at that point, a discussion on the, the medical marijuana ballot proposal from 2008. And if we go back now to somewhat, but, but in the general discussion of, of how we are seeing government happen in the state, um, the same-sex marriage was passed, uh, the amendment was passed in 2004. What position does it put you as lawmakers in of, of writing legislation that sometimes can come back and, and clarify, in the case of medical marijuana, vague language, or seeing as this is now playing out in, in the same-sex marriage debate, uh, what, when you as lawmakers are there to write policy and yet these other things come in as ballot proposals, what does it do to the process of how all of you are trying to, to govern and find uh, the balance as to how we enact and then carry out uh, the will of the people, as it were. And I think it's right there, what, what you said, the, the will of the people. And ultimately, it is the people who elect the legislators. Um, but the ballot proposals are part of the process. And as we know, you know, history changes. We, we can change history. And I think as it relates to the whether it's the marijuana issue or the LGBT issue in, in, in marriages, I think we'll be on the right side of history if we make sure we're addressing the will of the people. And right now, the will of the people are basically saying, give, give us some structure to make sure that, you know, we are allowed to get married. And we should be married, constitutionally, that they should be able to marry whomever they would like to marry. As it relates to the, the marijuana issue, we know overwhelmingly that ballot proposal passed. So it, it was legislation that uh, watered down the will of the people. In one other look at this, as if there is another way to take a, another example, then we, the, the issue of, of uh, the wolf hunt. We saw a ballot proposal, then we saw legislation that overturned that, another ballot proposal, and now legislation that would make certain uh, bills then, quote unquote, referendum proof. What sort of precedent do we see for either the government in this state or for those of you that, that watch and, and see the precedents in, in other states where we see um, is this an over politicization, um, politicking? I, I will try to find a word that, that best describes what's going on here in terms of all of these potential competing interests getting involved in the same issue and, and one, uh, the, the push and the pull that's going on here. How, how often do we see that going on? Um, we don't see it often, but in the past two years mm -hmm. we've seen it uh, quite a bit, whether it's the, the wolf hunting issue or the abortion rider. Um, as you know, this governor vetoed that legislation, and, and, and I believe he even heard from his wife and daughter that they didn't want anything to do with that and didn't want the state to, to have that. But the, the process allowed uh, the Republican-led legislature to get around that, and ultimately we are the first state that will require uh, a, a woman or individual to have uh, abortion insurance. 
The legislature made us the 20th state to call on Congress to pass a balanced budget amendment. Uh, 34 such resolutions would be needed to, to call a constitutional convention and a potential bill then would have to come back around for ratification by uh, three quarters of the states. Good idea to ask the feds do what we try to do each year in this state or are required to do and that's pass a balanced budget? Sure. Why, why shouldn't they pass a balanced budget? What do you think the prospects are of this going forward? I mean, do we know? I mean, are any contact with, as, as you were passing those resolutions in the legislature, do we know of 13, 14, 15, 16 states, whatever the case might be, that are taking this under consideration as we watch this move forward? I can't say with any certainty what the other 14 states may be doing, but um, I can say with, with absolute certainty that we should be producing balanced budgets on the state and federal level. Lawmakers are also reviewing courses at Michigan State, and this seems to be somewhat precedent setting. Um, reviewing the courses that are being taught there that they claim, that certain lawmakers are claiming are promoting unionization. And it's now news this week that as much as 500,000 in state support is at stake regarding the curriculum review. Uh, you were a student here at Central Michigan. You studied and graduated from Ferris State. Your district uh, is in the area of Saginaw Valley State University. Uh, should state government have the authority to determine funding based on what it's being taught at the school? Have we seen a precedent for this in the past? Um, we've also always seen uh, the state trying to impede into certain processes and in this case uh, higher education is one where we don't want to stifle the growth process of, of students whether it's at the graduate level, level or the undergraduate level. Um, but it's like you said, you know, are they going after unions or are they ultimately trying to make sure that we are producing uh, individuals who can work in this 21st century and, and take us further? When it comes to, to things such as saying uh, your funding level, 15 colleges and universities, is uh, going to be determined whether or not you hold tuition under a, a certain, um, you know, parameters that are set, that, that seems to be one thing. But I don't recall that we've seen a public uh, issue being made of this based on uh, curriculum being taught at, a, at a, a particular university, an area of what's being taught. Um, what kind of road are we potentially going down if this is uh, an area that the lawmakers from either side could begin to look at what's being taught at a certain school and then start making decisions when it comes to the dollars and cents? Um, ultimately, I think it's a slippery slope. Um, but it's a slope that we've seen before. It was just last term where uh, they did not want uh, college graduate students to, to unionize, therefore that they, they made it part of the best practices. Uh, I believe that's the term we're looking for. Um, no matter what you call it, it's, a, it's an attempt to make sure people are not unionizing and they're not um, having their personal rights protected and their, their right to work in a work, work environment. We need to make sure that that does not slip into our universities, although it's already there. It's just renamed every term something a little different. We'll get in a moment to the specifics of Saginaw schools, but, but first on the general issue of oversight. Uh, the authority and the reach of the Educational Assessment Authority has been in recent debate, of course, in Lansing. Uh, currently overseeing 15 schools in Detroit, and the question of the level and the reach of the authority was up for debate. Where do we stand right now? What, what came out of uh, the legislature? What's being considered as to the, the structure and what the EAA can, can do in the state? Um, last year we started the debate and the vote was not taken in part because we advocated uh, that we needed to see if the EAA was working. Whether you talk to parents, students, teachers, superintendents, they're willing to make changes. They just want to make, make sure the changes that are being made will work and are proven. Uh, what we did find is that the students who are within the EAA in Detroit in those 15 school districts uh, are, are not performing any better. And in some cases, they're performing worse. So now the legislature uh, seeks to expand it to the rest of the state. Um, the vote was taken up and it passed with two votes. Uh, two votes um, it got it out of the House. Now it is in the Senate and it's my hope that the bill will not move forward. Um, I think the fact that they only passed it with two votes sends a message that this is probably not 
the best thing for uh, public education and it's not the best thing for the state. The test scores show that it's not working in Detroit, so why would we expand it to the rest of the state? Now, last fall, House Democrats presented a model for, uh, it was said to, to help the struggling schools without having those schools moved under the authority of the EAA. What came of that proposal uh, in terms of any framework pieces into the structure of, of how EAA is at this point? Um, the Republican le legislature did not move it. Um, and, and that's not enough just to, to make it partisan, Democrat, Republican. When, some, when a bill passes by just two votes, it lets you know that there's enough people in the room out of those 110 legislators who feel like this is probably not a good idea. And now a little bit more in, in our final five minutes here as we look to what is going on specifically in the, the districts um, that, that are within uh, your 95th district. How would the authority as we see it right now and, and as you've illustrated for us for the EAA relate to the debate and the action taken last spring when it came to Highland Park and, and more specifically to Buena Vista schools in your district? Um, what we had, what was being proposed and, and what was done there versus what EAA is now. Um, keep in mind, again, unprecedented across the United States, a school district has never been dissolved. Uh, Buena Vista School District was dissolved, and not only was it dissolved, it was dissolved hastily. Um, I called for a comprehensive plan for time, not for the sake of just taking time, but making sure that, that not only the teachers and the students knew what was going on, that parents knew what was going on. And all of this f fell on the backs of the, the state. At the end of the day, I received calls in, in my office wanting to know, okay, if I, if I move my child, will they have transportation to get there? I couldn't answer that because it had not been determined whether the state would fund uh, the transportation. Right now, we need to make sure we're making the best decisions, and in order to do that, that's going to take time. There's no doubt that with, uh, with plants closing, that there's been a, a lot of families and, and children moving out of the district with uh, schools of choice. Um, there's been a, a lot that will show you that there's been a decline, but we also know that there's been one point one billion dollars taken out of uh, education and school aid fund directly for school allowances which go towards the per pupil count not towards the building itself but towards per pupil um, allowance and, and that in itself is enough to make any superintendent frustrated when they're trying to figure out their budget. What impact then did we see on Saginaw schools then at the end of the year going into this especially now looking at the proposed deficit reduction plans that are under review for Saginaw schools, how many of those students were uh, immediately absorbed by Saginaw schools to now find themselves in this present situation in the aftermath of Buena Vista? Keeping in mind that, that uh, Saginaw Public Schools knew of its own uh, deficit elimination plan and they had recently closed many of those uh, school buildings. So you may have a child that went from Saginaw Public Schools, a school that was closed, to went to Buena Vista only to find the whole district closed. Um, now having those same parents going nine months later, um, what's going on in Saginaw? And what people need to know, this is not a Buena Vista, uh, Saginaw Public School issue. As we know now, Bridgeport Spalding is also looking at their deficit elimination plan. There's over 50 school districts in the state of Michigan that have a deficit, deficit elimination plan. And as we sought to dissolve Buena Vista School District, people, it's not lost on people that Pontiac was in the same position, Saginaw Public, Buena Vista School District needed less than a million dollars to move forward. Pontiac needed several million dollars, but Pontiac received that funding. So the question that I'm receiving is, why didn't they dissolve Pontiac schools? Oakland County, richest county in the state, and surrounding school districts. Is there a reason why Pontiac was allowed to be sustained? Um, Ultimately, I think there's many ads, many responses to that, but what we need to get to is a comprehensive plan for these districts that are struggling due to the fact that the education, uh, the school aid fund has been, been raided. Is there something short of addressing that, that specific concern of how we have seen the, the reduction in funding for schools and the roller coaster ride it's taken? In our final minute and the last word for you then, is it, Recognizing we've seen this, the, the population changes that we've seen over the past decade, is it time to re-examine completely the way, the, the, the funding model for the way that we pay for schools? 
That's possible. Again, we have not seen the state handle the education system this as disastrously as they have since Kalkaska in 1993, in which we then ended up with Proposal A in 1994. So. Um, to say that there doesn't need to be a change in funding, I'm not here in a position to say that today, but I do think we need to do something so that uh, we can put public education back where it needs to be as a priority for this state. 20 years is a long time in perspective and how the situation, the, the landscape can change in, in a lot of ways. We're going to have to leave the discussion uh, right there, but it's one we want to continue to, uh, to certainly follow moving forward with that and, and all the issues we've had uh, time to talk on today. As always, good to see you, and thanks so much for taking the time once thank again to visit with us. Oh, thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining us, too, here on Capitol Report. Our guest has been Representative Stacey Irwin Oaks, Democrat from Saginaw, in her second term for the 95th District. I remember this program repeated tonight in our uh, overnight uh, rotation here on CMU Public Television, and then uh, very soon also added to uh, the programs on our website. You can go to WCMU.org, click on TV, WCMU Productions, and you'll find the link to our Capitol Report page. All the programs, including soon this, to join them uh, for our current season. For Chris Ogazali and all of our production crew, I'm David Nicholas. Thanks so much and uh, have a good week. You've been watching Capitol Report. Join us again as your elected officials speak to your concerns on current issues.